need of Christian, uh, I mean, uh, the restoration, the need of Christian church today. Restoration, the need of Christian church today. And that will be taken from uh, Book of Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Uh, Book of Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. So um, uh, Elsa uh, will be reading the Bible verses today. Uh, Elsa will be reading the Bible verses today. And uh, uh, as we are in the, in the new year, uh, if God allows, I will be uh, focusing on uh, this title for almost uh, uh, this whole month, maybe a few weeks. Uh, uh, and because uh, in my inner, inner spirit, I got a conviction uh, uh, that uh, the restoration is the uh, necessary thing for the Christian uh, Christian churches uh, in this in this new year, and even I got a I got a in, uh, confirmation about uh, uh, this topic when Pastor uh, Stephen Vargis uh, he was uh, I mean uh, preaching the word of God last Sunday and mentioning about the restoration. So that was the conviction that I got uh, through his message that I should preach about the restoration uh, for all, for this uh, whole month. I mean, so uh, we'll be going through the books of Ezra uh, and also Nehemiah and also the second Kings and the Psalms and some other books also. I mean, so we'll be just I mean, going through all, all those books and we'll be reading uh, some of the verses from uh, those books, maybe Ezra, Nehemiah and second, second Kings and uh, uh, the book of Psalms and also some other uh, books will be referred uh, to, to, to confirm that uh, the restoration is the need of the Christian church today, amen? So uh, this is going to be a, a kind of uh, historical uh, aspects maybe about the Jewish people from, the, from many uh, books of the Old Testament. So uh, uh, at last we'll be coming to the uh, spiritual uh, realm of this message and uh, we'll be continuing in that way. So now uh, we will be just I mean, thinking about something uh, which, is, uh, which is the historical background of the people of uh, Israel uh, from book of Ezra and especially from uh, book of Nehemiah also. So uh, uh, to, to start with, let us uh, uh, take the book of Ezra. Let us take the book of Ezra and uh, we are going to read Ezra chapter one, verses one through four. Ezra chapter one, verses one through four. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I, mean, Ezra, I mean, Elsa uh, will be reading from the book of Ezra and uh, I request uh, everyone to open your Bible, everyone to open your Bible and uh, read that portion while Elsa is reading. Amen. Okay. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he may so that he so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing thus did cyrus king of persia the lord the god of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth he has charged me to build him a house at jerusalem which is in judah whoever among you of all people may his god be with him and let him go up to jerusalem which is in judah and rebuild the house of the lord the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in, which, in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Amen. Thank you, Elsa. And uh, I know that uh, it is not easy to understand all those portions uh, just uh, reading once, but we will be uh, thinking about all those portions maybe uh, later. And uh, 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 we'll be studying uh, from those verses, maybe a few minutes after. Uh, let me uh, give uh, uh, you some, some of the introduction about our title today. Uh, that is, uh, uh, let us think about, I mean, the word restoration, the word restoration. So we are going to think about the word restoration. Then after thinking that only, we will be going uh, forward. I mean, so uh, the Hebrew word, I mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, shoe is, used for the, the English word restoration. So uh, the, the Hebrew word is used, shu is the, uh, the word for restoration, and which means uh, uh, to, to, to return to a prior state and restore to a former condition of uh, or our turning back. Okay, so that means, you know, restoration is a, is a, is a, is a process of turning back to God, or it's a, it's a process of uh, uh, restoring ourselves 
to the presence of God or coming back to God, coming back to the presence of God or returning uh, back to the prior state, state. So we had a good state or we had a good I mean, position uh, before. And if you lose that, then we have to come, come back to God and we have to come back to the prior situation or prior uh, blessed state of our Christian life. So that is the, that's the meaning of the, uh, the word restoration or in Hebrew, it is written shu. Okay, so it may entail the uh, actual physical action of turning or referring uh, to spiritually turning from evil to God. I mean, so this, is, this should be a, a physical action that there should be a, a radical change in our Christian life to come back to God or turning back from our evil things to God, to the presence of God in, 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 a, in, a, spiritual, in a spiritual manner. Okay, so now we will go to the uh, introduction of, uh, for the introduction for the uh, book of Ezra and also for the, I mean, topic. So I'll give you some uh, introduction about the book of Ezra uh, and uh, uh, the topic also. Let us see who was Ezra. You know, as a matter of fact, it, it is not easy to get into the uh, spiritual meanings and aspects of uh, the Christian life without knowing the back history of Ezra uh, and, uh, and the book of Ezra and the history of people uh, of Israel and the captivity and the return of the remnant and the restoration. So there are many things to be understood. I mean, from the, from the Old Testament books, especially from the book of Ezra and the Nehemiah. So we have to think about what was the history of the people of Israel and how they were going to the captivity and how they were returning back from the captivity and what is the what is the remnant and what is the restoration and what is the history of the book of Ezra and the Nehemiah and other books. I mean, so after knowing all those things only, we will be able to get the spiritual meanings and the aspects of a Christian life. So we have to think about one thing that we have a special blessing upon the people of God, I mean, through restoration. I mean, so we are going to enter into the restoration in the coming days. Maybe, I mean, we are going to receive a special blessing in this new year. I mean, how I many of you believe that we are going to receive a special blessing from the Lord in this 2021? Hallelujah. So before that, we have to know what was the history of the people of Israel. We have to know what was the history of the book of Ezra. And we have to know what was the history, I mean, how these people were in the capital activity or how these people went into the captivity or the exile and how these people were returning back from the captivity as the remnant to the restoration, to the restoration, to the I mean, place of Jerusalem, I mean, to the place of Jerusalem. So let me tell you something about uh, these things. And uh, it, it is believed that this book was written by Ezra, the book of Ezra. I mean, it is believed that this book was written by Ezra, the scribe of Israel and written in between, I mean, B. C. 457 and 444. It was written, it is believed that it is, I mean, uh, I mean, written by uh, uh, Ezra, the scribe, and uh, it was written in the time of, uh, I mean, BC uh, 457 and uh, 444. Okay, now let us come back to the, uh, to think about who was Ezra, who was Ezra. Okay, the first one is Ezra was a priest. Ezra was a priest. I mean, so uh, when you go to Ezra chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, and also chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, all these verses speaks about that Ezra was a priest. Ezra was a priest. He was a priest, and he was the son of a priest. He was the priest, and he was the son of a priest. And he is in the genetic line of the priesthood. That is what we see and we understand from these verses. Maybe Ezra chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, and also from chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. I mean, uh, that, is, that is what we see. That is the first point that Ezra was a priest. Ezra was a priest. And secondly, who was Ezra? Ezra was a scribe. Ezra was a scribe. You know, uh, in the Gospels, we frequently read about the scribes and the Pharisees, right? When we, when we go to uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that it, during the time of Jesus Christ, there were many uh, scribes and Pharisees. So here we see that Ezra was a scribe, but Ezra was not living during the time of Jesus Christ. Ezra was living 
before how many many years ago of uh, um, the time of Jesus Christ but even 450 years ago of the time of Jesus Christ okay in the in the history we read that Ezra was a scribe in Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 we read that verse okay Ezra chapter 7 verse 6 this Ezra went up from Babylon he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord the God of Israel had given the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord, his God was on him. Very good. Okay, so th th there we read that Ezra was a Ezra was a scribe, and the term scribe is an official political term, which is associ associated with uh, uh, a state secretary or the secretary of the state or a royal private secretary. So this is the position of a scribe in those days, in those days, okay? So the scribe is an official term which is used for, to, to indicate that that person is a state secretary. Okay, why, why I'm saying this? You know, when we say that Ezra was a, a state secretary of, you can call him as a royal private secretary of that, of, of that government, of the kingdom, you know, we have to understand one thing, Ezra, even though he was a priest and Ezra, even though he was a he was a scribe, I mean he was knowing everything, and he was used by God to come back to Jerusalem, and God was using him to rebuild the the temple. I mean, so that's what that's what we are going to see in Ezra chapter seven verse six. It says that I mean he was a scribe, he was a skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. I mean, so he was very skilled in the law of Moses. Ezra was very skilled in the law of Moses. That Moses, I mean, Moses, he was somebody, I mean, who understand the law of Moses. Okay, so 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 so, so Ezra, sorry, Ezra was somebody who understand the law of Moses. He was somebody who understand the Old Testament very well. And he was somebody, I mean, uh, who was, I mean, spending hours and hours, I mean, uh, on the books of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So he was a person who was knowing all the things very well, maybe, I mean, which is written in the Pentateuch. So he was a great man. He was who was writing the books and he was writing the scrolls and also he was knowing everything from the Pentateuch. I mean, so this is the speciality of this man. You know, there are many things to share about Ezra, but uh, I mean, uh, we will be thinking all those things uh, uh, maybe maybe later. So the book of Ezra tracks the return of a remnant of God's people from exile in Babylon as they re-established themselves in the land of Israel. So we will be thinking of all those things maybe later in our in our message. So before we go to the uh, go to the main title of our message, that is restoration. I mean, restoration is the main message, and uh, that is the main title of our message. We should know the need of the restoration. What is the need of the restoration? You know, we see that people of Israel they were I mean uh, uh, gone into the captivity and they were coming back from the uh, they were returning back from the captivity to Jerusalem and they were restored they were restored back so let us know what was the need of the restoration what is the need of the restoration I mean that means if there is no captivity or if there is no exile of if, if if there is no separation from the presence of God or if there is no disobedience of the word of God or if there is no loss of something or, or, or a destruction, there would not be a need of restoration. That is very, very true. That, that's a true thing. You know, when there is a captivity, there is a need of restoration. When the people are separated from the presence of God, there is a need of restoration. I mean, when the, the, the people are destroyed, I mean, there is a need of the restoration when the people of god are losing something there is a need of restoration i mean when the people of god they are going away from the presence of god and doing some evil things and god is saying them you have to be returned back to god you have to be returned back to god and you need to be i mean have a restoration in your life hallelujah so now let's think a few things about the captivity of israel the captivity of israel i mean now uh, when we when we when we study about the captivity of israel it is very clear that it was prophesied by prophet jeremiah okay so when we when we study about the captivity of israel 
you know, without knowing what was the captivity of uh, captivity or exile period of Israel, it is uh, it is not easy to understand what is the restoration. So now we are going to think about what is the captivity of Israel. Okay, so it is very clearly written in 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 book of Jeremiah, book of Jeremiah, and uh, Jeremiah, prophet Jeremiah was, I mean, giving the prophecy about that the people of Israel will be going to the captivity. That's what we read in Ezra chapter one verse one. Once again, we will read, uh, I mean, Ezra chapter one verse one. Then uh, we will go to that, uh, I mean, point. It is written. I will read Elsa. Uh, it is written now in the first year of Cyrus. I mean, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, by the mouth of Jeremiah. That means Jeremiah prophesied about, I mean, something is going to happen for you. That means Jeremiah, I mean, prophesied that, I mean, uh, the people of God is going to be in the exile time or the, or, or the captivity. So that is going to happen because of many reasons. I mean, the, and were this prophecy uh, recorded in the book of Jeremiah? It is in it is in uh, chapter twenty-five, book of uh, uh, Jeremiah, chapter twenty-five, verses eleven and twelve. I mean, Elsa, you can read that verse. Yeah. This Jeremiah. whole land shall become a ruined waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. Then, after seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. The land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I mean, see, here it is written, I mean, by the prophet Jeremiah, it is written that, I mean, surely you will go to the captivity. You will go to the captivity. There are many reasons for that. We'll be thinking about all those things. So let me tell you one thing, you know, everything happens according to the word of God. Okay, everything were happening in the life of the people of Israel, in the history of the people of Israel, according to the, I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the messages or according to the prophecy of the prophet and according to the word of God. I mean, that should be fulfilled. You know, Jeremiah said, okay, I mean, you are going to be in captivity. I mean, but I mean, something is going to happen. The same thing is written in, in Ezra chapter one, verse one. So this is what we have to understand. You know, God is having a purpose and God is having a special, I mean, way for the people of God. I mean, whenever we are going through the difficult situation, whenever we are going through the, I mean, I mean, a hardship or, I mean, troublesome situation in our life. I mean, so that's what we read uh, from this verse. Now let us see, I mean, when and why the Jews were attacked and taken to captivity. I mean, when and, I mean, why these people were attacked and taken to captivity. I mean, so we will go to uh, those, I mean, portions, maybe, you know, in uh, uh, 920 BC, BC 920, so you will get the, I mean, screen sharing of, of that uh, details now. I mean, uh, because uh, it is, I mean, it's, it's not easy to understand all those things, the dates and everything. So it will be coming there. Yeah. Okay. So in in uh, BC 920, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. Okay. So we are going to study about the captivity of the people of Israel, how these people were captured and how these people were attacked and how these people were going to the captivity or the exile in different places, maybe in Assyria and Babylon or all those places. Okay, now, I mean, in uh, 900, uh, 920, BC, 920 BC, Israel was divided into, into I mean, two kingdoms, I mean, the, the, the Israel and the Judah. So the 10 Northern tribes rebelled against the Lord and they set up an alternative religious system. Uh, 10 northern kingdom, northern tribes, okay? There were 12 tribes in Israel and 10 northern tribes were rebelling against God and they were setting up uh, an alternative uh, religious system. But the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained faithful to the Lord for a while. This is the important thing that we have to understand, okay? 10 northern tribes, they were rebelling against God and they, are, they were arranging another alternative, I mean, religious system. At the same time, two tribes like Judah and Benjamin, they remained faithful to the Lord for a while. And a remnant from the 10 Northern tribes joined to Southern tribes. That is known as the Judah. Okay, a remnant, remnant means a left of people. Okay, a, a, a few number of people. Okay, so those people from the Northern 
tribes, they joined the two southern tribes known as the Judah to worship the Lord in, in Jerusalem. So only two tribes were taking a decision that we will be in Jerusalem and we will be worshiping God. We are not planning to go anywhere because we have to worship Jehovah God. So they took a decision, these two tribes, I mean, known as the Judah, they, 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 were, no, I mean, they were taking a decision that we will worship the Lord in Jerusalem itself. So that is the history. And the second one is in, in, in uh, BC 720, BC 720, the 10 northern tribes were taken into the captivity in Assyria. Remember one thing, in 720 BC, the northern, the ten, 10 northern tribes were taken into the captivity in Assyria. By this time, judgment has been prophesied against the Judah for their rebellion against the Lord. I mean, and again, in 586 BC, in 586 BC, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Okay, in 586 BC, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and many were taken into the exile to Babylon. Many were taken into the exile or captivity of Babylon. Now, let us see how they were returned back to Jerusalem and under whose leadership, that is the another point. Okay, so now we were thinking about how what was the captivity and how these people were taken into the captivity. Now, we will go to the next point, that is how these people were returned back to Jerusalem. You can see that, that, that history also in the screen. What is that? I mean, how these people were returned back to Jerusalem and under whose leadership? It was the first one is, first one is it was in BC 538. It was in BC 538. The first group of Jews returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel, which is mentioned in Ezra chapter 2. We, we are not going to read that verses because there are many verses about that. But I mean, it is written in chapter 2 that in BC 538, the first group of people of I mean, Israel or Jewish, Jewish people, they returned to Jerusalem under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, you may be knowing about that name, Zerubbabel, which is, which is mentioned in uh, Ezra chapter, chapter 2. And again, it was in 536 BC, it was in 536 BC, the second group of Jewish people, the second group of Jewish people, they returned to Jerusalem. And it was with the permission of King Cyrus of Persia. That is written in chapter 1, verse 1. It is very clearly written in chapter 1, verse 1. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and all, all put it in writing saying. Okay, so this is what we understand in the year of BC 536, the second group is coming back from uh, the captivity to Jerusalem. It was with the permission of a king, the King Cyrus of Persia. And, they re and after that only, they are rebuilding the temple, which is mentioned in chapter one, verse one. Okay, so, I mean, uh, they, they rebuild the temple of Jerusalem after coming back in BC 536, again. The next, uh, I mean, uh, I'm returning back is in uh, BC 445. Okay, I told you uh, in, in the beginning session, we will be uh, thinking about the historical things, okay? So later we will be going to the spiritual aspects and spiritual meanings of uh, the captivity and the restoration. Now, we will go to the next, uh, next return back is, it is in BC 445, okay? So the third group. The third group, first group, second group, and third group is coming from, uh, from the captivity. The Jewish people, they are returning back to Jerusalem under the leadership of Nehemiah, under the leadership of Nehemiah. And that was the time they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, which is mentioned in the book of Nehemiah. Okay, so the first one is, I mean, uh, when, when they were coming back under the leadership of Serubabel, they were rebuilding the the, I mean, what is that? Uh, uh, okay, after that, they were rebuilding the uh, temple in Jerusalem. Now, 
when they were coming under the leadership of Nehemiah, they were trying to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, the wall of Jerusalem. I mean, that is in, in Nehemiah also. Now, let us see what are the, what are the reasons of their captivity. What are the reasons of their captivity? I told you, if there is no captivity, if there is no exile, if, I mean, the people are not captured by the enemies or other people, there is no need of restoration. Now, we are thinking about the reasons of their captivity. Why these people, the people of Israel, why the Jewish people were taken into Babylon and in other places uh, as, as, as captives or as slaves? Okay, the reasons of their captivity. Okay, so there are many reasons of their captivity recorded in uh, Second Kings chapter 17. When you read uh, Second Kings chapter 17, verses 7 through 17, you know, there are many reasons, many reasons that why the people of Israel or why the Jewish people were taken to the captivity that is recorded there. So the first thing is the spiritual apostasy of the people of Israel. I mean, the first reason of the captivity of the Jewish people, it was the spiritual apostasy. You may be knowing the word apostasy, okay? The meaning of the word apostasy. Apostasy means, simply means, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, falling away from the presence of God or going away from the word of God or going from, going away from the presence of God. That is the meaning of God. Okay, that is the meaning of apostasy. So spiritual apostasy was one of the main reasons of the captivity of Jewish people. That which is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. We will read that verse. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. They had feared other gods. Okay, so what is that? Spiritual apostasy, that is the one of the uh, main reason of the captivity of Jewish people, and that is mentioned there, okay? That was the general reason for Israel's defeat. Okay, that is the general reason for Israel's defeat. You know, the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, they were suffering there in Egypt. They were in the bondage in Egypt, and they were, I mean, hard working in Egypt. I mean, there, there, there was nobody to help them. Okay, in the situation, I mean, God arranged Moses and Aaron to bring those people from Egypt to, to, the, to the Canaan, the, 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 the land of Canaan. Okay, but what happens here, the people of Israel, even though they came back from Egypt, they were sinning against the Lord's God and the, the law of God who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. Okay, and they were not knowing that God is the one who brought them from under the, under the hands of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So the northern tribes of Israel were turning their backs to their gracious God who delivered them from the terror of the Egypt. They were suffering there, but they were just not, just not knowing or remembering or realizing what was the work of God, what was the miracle of God, and how these people were, I mean, I mean returned back from Egypt to the Canaan. What was the provisions of God? They just forget it. And they were just sinning against God. So that, that was the, the main, I mean, reason that uh, the people of God were give, going to the captivity. So the reason of their captivity was the people of Israel sinned against God. They sinned against God. I mean, the very God who delivered them from the hands of the Pharaoh and from the, I mean, from the problems and, and the hard work of the Egypt, I mean, who brought them into the land of promise. If they obeyed, if they obeyed, there would be safety. If they obeyed, there would be prosperity and blessing. And the history of the nation was marked by violations of God's law. You know, those people, even though they <coughs> came back from the, the, the uh, captivity of uh, or exile period of, I mean, Egypt, those people again and again, they were, I mean, they were violating, they were violating the God's law. 
God gave them many laws and rules and regulations, but those people, even though they are coming out of the captivity, they were sinning against God. I mean, the second thing, the second thing is, I mean, they're steeped into the idolatry, which is written in the in the verse seven. I mean, verse seven, it is written, I mean, they steeped into the okay, what is that? Okay, maybe Ezra chapter seven, verse seven. Yeah. Yeah, already. No, sorry. Second Kings chapter 17, uh, verse uh, 7. Okay. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 7. Already we read it. Okay. Now we will go to that point. Okay. They steeped into the idolatry. They steeped into the idolatry. Okay. Then again, they followed the customs of heathen people. That is in verse 8. Read Elsa, that verse 8. Second Kings chapter 17. And walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. See, what is that? They followed the customs of heathen people. You know, they were mingled with the heathen people, and they were teaching many things from their own culture and their own, I mean, system and customs. So these people, the people of Israel, they were, I mean, just following the customs of heathen people. That is written in verse 8. And when we go to verse 9, verse 9, we read that, that verse 9. And the people of Israel did secretly against the Lord their God things that were not right. They built for themselves high places in in all their towns from, from, watch, from watchtower to fortified city. Okay. So what is that? They did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord's their God. I mean, you know, they were doing something secretly. At the same time, in public, they are very good people. They are very good people in public, but secretly they are doing many sins against God. I mean, they were, I mean, doing something which is against the will of God. Okay, again, in verse 10, in verse 10, read verse 10. They set up for themselves pillars in Asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. Okay, that means they were worshipping the pagan idols. You're getting the screen sharing, I think, Dave. Okay, so they were worshipping the pagan idols. They were worshipping the pagan idols. Again, we will go to verse, verse 11. Yeah. And there they made offerings on all the high places, as the nations did whom the Lord carried away before them. And they did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. That means they were engaged in wicked things. They were engaged in wicked things. And again, verses 13 and 14. Verses 13 and 14. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer saying, turn from evil, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with all the law that I have commanded your fathers and that I have sent you by my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen. They were, sub they were stubborn as their fathers had been, who did not believe in the Lord their God. Okay, what happened? They mocked the prophets. They mocked the prophets. Okay, so now we are coming to that point, you know, why these people were taken into the captivity or what is the reasons, what are the reasons of their captivity? The people of Israel received a bent of the findings from, from, from the Lord through the prophets. Okay, they were departing from the ways of God, but prophets were prophesying, okay, this is not right. I mean, you are doing good. I mean, you are doing you know, many prophets had warned Israel that the disaster, I mean, lay ahead, I mean, if they refused to repent. You know, prophet Hosea, Micah, and prophets Isaiah had over and over again, I mean, stated that Israel's idolatry and the immorality and oppression of the poor would bring divine judgment. But they didn't listen to the words of prophets. You know, these, I mean, prophets, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, and all those prophets and Jeremiah also were speaking many things, uh, I mean, to the people of Israel, and you have to come back to God. I mean, you have to leave all your idolatry. You have to leave all your morality, and, and otherwise you will get a divine judgment. But they didn't listen the words of prophets. They didn't listen the words of prophets. Because of these reasons, because of these reasons, God permitted Assyria to conquer the nation of Israel. We are coming to that point. Because of these reasons, because of the, the above mentioned reasons, you know, God permitted Assyria, God permitted Assyria, an Assyrian king, to conquer the nation of Israel. You may be asking a question to me that whether God was helpless to rescue the people from their enemies? 
Maybe you are, you are having a question in your mind. Okay, whether God was helpless to rescue the people from the enemies. But remember, it is not like that. It's not that God was helpless to rescue Israel from the Assyrian enemies. In fact, he was the one who raised up the enemy and brought them into the Palestine to destroy the people. That means, that means God was permitting something. God was allowing something. God was permitting the other people, the enemies, and those people came and captured these people, and they were just, uh, I mean, taking them to the captivity. So let me remind you one thing from this point, that sometimes God will allow or God will permit some incidents in our life with a purpose to make us, I mean, make some changes in our life and to let us near to God. You know, sometimes we also will be going through some difficult situations and we are saying, oh, oh it is not easy for me to, I mean, get, to, get out of this problem, to get out of this captivity, get out of this troublesome situation. But remember one thing, sometimes, not always, sometimes God will be permitting every one of us or God will be permitting some of the problems, some of the problems and, and God will allow somebody to make some problem in our life to, I mean, change our life and to, and, and that God's, I mean, God's desire is that we have to, I mean, come near to God. That's the reason that God is allowing or God is permitting those problems. So we are supposed to realize the God's purpose in our problems and troubles. You know, we have to realize what is the God's purpose when I'm going through the problem, when I'm going through the troubles, what is the God's purpose behind it? I mean, because it is clearly written in the Bible that captivity was a part of God's discipline and chastening the people. I mean, Bible says that the captivity or the period of exile was one of the, one of the part of the disciplining of God or chastening of God. I mean, you know, as uh, Brother George Paul uh, said last week in the, in the time of uh, Sam's exhortation that David prayed to God to discipline him, right? George was saying that, okay? David prayed to God. How many of you pray that, oh Lord, I need a discipline from the Lord and I'm coming to your presence and I need a discipline from the Lord. How many of you are praying? I don't know, okay? He was saying that okay, David prayed in the presence of God to discipline him. I mean, it's true that we need to be disciplined by God always. We have to pray to the Lord. Oh Lord, I need a discipline from the Lord. I mean, I'm giving myself in the hands of God that you may, you may discipline me, you may chastise me, no problem. I'm ready to accept all your chastisement and I'm ready to accept all your disciplining. I mean, so let us, uh, let, the, let, the, let the punishments of God or chastisements of God or discipline of God, I mean, lead us to a repentance and help us to return back to God. I mean, that's what we understand from this verse. And remember, this is the right time to restoration, or this is the right time to get the restoration. And, I, and usually, you know, we read one verse from Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Usually we read that verse, I mean, uh, maybe Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Can you read that verse? Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I think that that verse is not given to Elsa. Can you read that verse, Elsa? Jeremiah 29, verse 11. Um, yeah. yeah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Okay. So usually we read this verse uh, when? Eh? Maybe during the time of the New Year meeting uh, as a promise verse, right? This is a promise verse which is which you are getting uh, during the time of New Year. Okay, so uh, but we don't uh, read the previous verse, maybe verse ten, which says in order to get a get a bright future and blessing or to be restored back, we will have to go through some troublesome situation. Is it right? Read that verse ten also. Verse ten also. Same chapter ten. Yeah. Jeremiah chapter twenty nine, verse ten. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill you to my promise and bring you back to this place. 
Okay. So what happened? Sometimes, you know, we read only Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, and we will uh, praise the Lord and we will say glory, hallelujah, because I have a bright future. I have a bright future. Okay. Remember, the previous verse says that, okay, I mean, in order to get into the bright future and in order to get the blessings from the Lord and in order to be restored back to the Lord, I mean, we will have to go through many troublesome situations in our life. I mean, so that's what we understand from this verse. Now, let us, let us, I mean, let us see, I mean, what are the provisions of God? What are the provisions of God to come out of the exile? That is the next point. Let us see what are the provisions of God to come out of the captivity. So we have many verses to read, but we are going to read, we are not going to read all those verses, but we will, I mean, explain those things and we will finish the message today. So God's provisions to come out of the exile or out of the captivity. So we see many of the God's provision for the people of God and many opportunities to them to get prepared to come out of the exile or to come out of the captivity. You know, the story begins like, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. Ezra chapter 1 verse 1 says, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Okay, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia. So that is the first provision that God had made for them, I mean, to, to bring them back from the captivity. So actually, remember one thing, Cyrus was not a Jewish king. Cyrus was not a Jewish king. He was a Gentile king. But in order to fulfill the word of God, the Lord used Cyrus, the king of Persia. This is, this is amazing to know that God can use anyone to do a miracle in our life. Hallelujah. So God was using the heathen or the Gentile king Cyrus to bring the people back to Jerusalem. I mean, even though he was not a, I mean, Jewish king, but he was a heathen king. I mean, God can use anyone. God can use anyone, I mean, to do the miracles in our life. Hallelujah. And secondly, when you read Ezra chapter 1 verse 5, Ezra chapter 1 verse 5, God motivated, I mean, excited Jews to return. That we read there, it is everyone whose heart God had moved. The, peop the, the, the heart of the people of God were moved and they were, I mean, motivated to come back to Jerusalem. So this is the work of God. And that is the work of God. You know, you know, when you are moved to do something, when you are motivated to do something, remember one thing, God is working in you. I mean, God I mean, needs to bring you back to the restoration. God needs to bring you back to the, I mean, the, 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 the prior state of your blessing. I mean, that's what we read here. And again, when you read uh, chapter 6, verse 22, okay, I think uh, yeah, you're getting that uh, I mean, screen in a, in, a, in a device. And Ezra chapter 6, verse 22, it says that God changed the heart of the king of Assyria. So that also is the work of God. God changed the heart of the king of Assyria. And again, when you read uh, Ezra chapter 7, verses 27 and 28, Ezra chapter 7, verses 27 and 28. I mean, just read that verse only, Elsa. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the kings and the counselors, before all the king's mighty, mighty officers. I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was on me. And I gathered leading the men from Israel to go up on me. Praise God. Hallelujah. This is one of the best provision of God for the people of Israel to, 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 to come back to the I mean, Jerusalem. I mean, that's just what you really understand. You know, very God motivated the king of Persia to beautify the house of God, the temple of God, beautifying the house of God. So God is motivating the king of Persia to motivate or to, to, to beautify the house of God. And that caused both kings to submit to God's sovereign will. Hallelujah. So these are the ways and the provisions that God arranged for the, for the people of God to come out of the captivity. So as I am explaining about how the Jews were, I mean, gone into captivity and how they could come back to Jerusalem. I mean, let me remind you, I mean, one thing that 
God has a special plan and purpose about, I mean, you and me, and he will provide many opportunities to our life to come out of the situations of captivity. I mean, if, if God has a plan about you and me, God will arrange something. God will arrange something. If the people of God are crying into the presence of God and they are praying and they are saying, oh Lord, we need to come back to you, Lord. And we need to, I mean, to, to come out of the captivity in different, in, in different realms. I mean, today most of the Christian people are not aware about, I mean, that they are under the slavery of many things. I mean, they do not know. Many of the Christians, many of the Christians, they do not know they are under the slavery of many things. And they are captured by many of the worldly things. They are captured by many of the worldly things. They are under the slavery and, and they are under the captivity of many of the worldly things. But God is providing lots of opportunities to come out of the captivity. God is providing many of the opportunities in our life also to come out of the captivity. But we don't mind it. And we are often not concerned about the captivity. And we are not always concerned about the opportunities that God is I mean, providing for the people of God. So through this message, I'm not planning to uh, just give some information about the captivity of Jews or the historical backgrounds, uh, I mean, of those things and how the restoration was happening in the life of people of Israel. Rather, let me try to connect. Let me try to connect and compare that situation uh, of the people of Israel, the history of the people of Israel to the spiritual life and the spiritual captivity of our people. I mean, so this is what I want to share with you this morning. I mean, if, if God allows, uh, we'll be thinking about uh, the, the, the other other I mean, topics maybe in the, in, the, in the upcoming, I mean, weeks. So this morning, let us all, I mean, surrender our life in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Let us, I mean, come together in the presence of God and uh, let us pray together and let us give ourselves with the mighty hand of God. Hallelujah. We have the God's presence in our midst. Hallelujah. I request everyone to close, close your eyes for a moment. Hallelujah. As we were listening from the word of God this morning, you know, this is what we have to understand why the people of Israel or why the Jewish people were gone into the captivity. And what is the restoration and how those people were coming or returning back from the captivity to the place of Jerusalem? And what are the reasons of those people that they were taken into the captivity? And how a person, how a Christian can, can come out of the captivity, the situation of the captivity or the situation of the slavery of many things? Hallelujah. You know, we have to understand, I mean, we have to, I mean, come back to the Lord and we have to come out of the captivity. So let us all surrender our life to the presence of God this morning, according to the word of God. Let us pray together. Hallelujah. As we are praying, I mean, dear brother Jovins is going to pray and let us submit ourselves with the mighty hand of God. We really need a restoration in our realms of spiritual realm and the physical realm and material realm and the financial realm. Hallelujah. How many of you believe that God is going to do a restoration for the people of God in every realm so far? Let us pray to the Lord. Oh Lord, I need a restoration in my spiritual life. Let us pray. Oh Lord, I need a restoration in my physical realm. I need a restoration in my material realm. I need a restoration in my mental realm. Hallelujah. I need a restoration in my I mean, financial realm. I know that there are many people, I mean, I mean, in the, in, the, in the year of 2020, they were going through many difficult situations. Hallelujah. But I believe that, I mean, God is going to provide many blessings upon the people in this 2020. Hallelujah. If you believe that, receive that word into your heart and pray together. Hallelujah. Oh Lord, I need that restoration. Hallelujah. I need that restoration. Hallelujah. Let us realize the reasons of our captivity. Let us realize which is the realm, which is the aspect that we are under the bondage. Let us remember, let us realize, I mean, where I am under somebody or where the, which is the place that I am, I mean, I, I'm under, I mean, something. I mean, let us remember, let us remember the reasons of the captivity. Let us know the need of the return back to God. Let us know the need of the return back to God. Let us be reminded about God's provision and opportunities to come out of the captivity. Most of the time, we are not aware about, I mean, God's provision. We are not aware about the opportunities that God has given to each person to come back from the captivity and to be restored and to be reestablished and to be blessed 
and be used for the kingdom of God. So now this is the time to to, to remind, to, to, to remember what is the God's provision and God's ways and God's opportunities, I mean, to come out of the captivity. Let us make use of the opportunities in all our realms and let us pray together in the presence of God. Can you de- do a personal prayer in the presence of God? And liking that, I mean, saying that, okay, Lord, I need to come back. I need to have that restoration. I need to come back to the Lord in every aspect of my life, in every realms of my life. This morning, shall we all close our eyes in the presence of God? Shall we all pray together? And I request Brother Jovins to lead us in prayer now.